Dear Princess Celestia, I've learned a lot about friendship. I was taught its kindness, generosity, honesty, and all other elements that made it up. Then I wiped that. <laughs> Pathetic piece of data from my memory banks, you see. I have no use for friendship. I am a cold-hearted robot who has no time for pathetic things like that. All I want in life is to do my tests in peace and not be disturbed by stupid, frail humans. So you sent your own sister to the moon. I assisted a fat orphan in sending two monstrosities to that white ball in the sky. <laughs> Scare game. Look into the mirror and say the dreaded name of the demon three times. Mighty Cyrus. I am Jeremy. Steve. Jesse. And V. Nobody wants to use Miley Cyrus. Okay. <laughs> Remember, you can subscribe to this show and several others in the MSP library at missionstarpodcast.com. You can follow us on Facebook. You can follow us on Twitter at rolling underscore twenties. You can subscribe to this show on iTunes and on Stitcher. You can send me any fan mail, suggestions for the show, or hate mail at mspfreight at yahoo.com. Uh, for the intro and outro, we are using the music of Machina Supremacy. You can find their music at machinasupremacy.com. Most of their discography is up for free download, with the exception of the latest couple albums, which you can, of course, find on amazon.com. Has the night been busy so far? I just got done scaring a bunch of little kids. Okay, so it's Friday. <laughs> yep. <laughs> what were you doing? Uh, Halloween carnival at my mom's school. Oh, okay. School. Shit. That, that sound is not gunfire, I swear. Um, I live behind a high school, and unfortunately, it's homecoming. Uh, don't lie, Jay. Well, I mean, I have to say something. It's not, you know, I don't want people to know I live in Watts. But I've closed everything I can, and surprisingly, the baby is still asleep. It's amazing. Yes, that's all that matters. Minor miracle, even. Yeah. But uh, other than that, it has been an interesting evening. For some reason, I sat down at dorkly.com and started reading their article, The 15 Most Disturbing Pokedex Entries in the World. <laughs> I could swear you just Dex? said Pokedex. Yes, Pokedex. <laughs> some of these are surprisingly effed up, man. I mean... Number 15 on the list is Kadabra. It's Pokedex entry in Fire Red is, It happened one morning. A boy with extrasensory powers awoke in bed transformed into a Kadabra. Yeah, that kind of sucks. Well, it, the, uh, the writer takes over and says, I don't think there's anything more horrifying than this truly Kafka-esque nightmare scenario. A kid falls asleep only to wake up to discover that he's turned into a Pokemon. A Pokemon that is bound to be captured by other humans, unaware they're training someone's child, to fight against random... Shit. To fight against random monster animals. But most horrifying of all, he's been transformed into a middle evolution. That means two things. One, all Abras are horribly deformed human children, and when it evolves into Kadabra, it has gone to sleep and awoken a monster. Two, every single Kadabra is a human child who has somehow switched places with Abras who have taken over the child's human bodies. And perhaps most terrifying of all, unless that child or cadaver is traded, he will never evolve and get that additional spoon. <laughs> Not to mention, you're stuck saying one word for the rest of your life. Yeah. I, it's, you know, it, we discussed it before, but there is some truly strange and bizarre shit that comes out of Pokemon. There's one here called a Lampant. Its Pokedex entry is that it, the spirit it absorbs... Excuse me. The spirits it absorbs fuel its baleful, baleful fire. It hangs around hospitals waiting for people to pass on. Interesting. Wow. So apparently there's an entire race of Pokemon that acts as the Grim Reaper. This Perfect is, subject matter for Halloween. Yeah, and we give this the stuff to kids. that conjure to mind are hilarious. <laughs> I know, and yet, you know, parents are willingly buying this shit for kids who are just reading it and going... You know, probably dressing in black, putting on black lipstick, and writing stupid poetry. <laughs> and they wonder why we have problems. <laughs> uh, at the beginning of the show, we use a clip from a uh, convention, believe it or not, where the person who was the voice actor of GLaDOS read a letter to Princess Celestia of My Little Pony fame. <laughs> if I have to explain any more than that, I think I might actually kill myself. <laughs> 
I'm familiar with all those things. <laughs> then you may find it a little odd. Uh, we'll add a link to the uh, website. Um, in our Kickstarter corner, we talked last week how Machina Supremacy is doing a fundraiser to start a world tour. Uh, they've actually raised over 20,000 euros. They've uh, unlocked the seventh country in their tour is Germany. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, that's after only 170 backers, so obviously the people putting in money are serious believers. Yeah. And it's still going till December 1st at their website, com. They're going to Finland, Russia, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, the UK, and now Germany. And they'll go somewhere else if they can get to 25,000 euros. It's, I still would like to see them in concert, but 25,000 euros, when adding that up, I don't think that's enough to get to the U.S. I think it would yeah. be more expensive, considering all the uh, personnel and gear they would need. Yep. And plane tickets. Yeah, sucks to be me. But uh, also, from Kickstarter, we've been talking about the Flame Store, The device that the tech obsessed will use to you know, be able to play Candy Crush around the campfire in the middle of the wilderness. <laughs> Uh, all joking aside, it's a mobile device that uses a differential between fire and water to charge your cell phone. It needs no other external plugs. Uh, it ended as of October 24th. It had 812 backers, a goal of $15,000, and ended at $60,143. Uh, nice. These things are not cheap. They cost about $100 per, but this device, it's, it's going to be going somewhere. I don't know if they're going to do any additional marketing and put it in stores eventually, but they have a product. So what else can you say but good for them? Good for them. <laughs> and uh, we also have the... Uh, ah, we've been talking about this for about four weeks now, the Bubblegum Crisis Ultimate Edition Blu-ray set. Uh-huh. The Kickstarter launched. Uh, it launched as of, I guess today, October 25th. Uh, it has a goal of $75,000 we discussed. This is being done by uh, Robert J. Woodhead, who, on behalf of Animigo out of Wilmington, North Carolina. After one day, it already has 430 backers. A goal of $75,000 currently stands at $27,859. It definitely launched very well. Yeah. Uh, this is still going to be a curiosity to see what happens. I mean, even after you present the company with all these funds to produce Blu-rays of this arguably classic series, whether or not they'll just say, keep your money and we'll do it ourselves. Ooh. Yeah. It is a possibility. There's nothing that says that after they raise this money that uh, the parent company has to sell them the rights. Yeah, that's true. So, I, I guess but the question... they be- should have copyright over the idea. The idea, yes, but still, when you're raising money for this specific purpose and then it doesn't get used, I wonder what happens to that f- to those funds. I think it gets refunded. Mm. Actually, I think I re- it never gets pulled in the first place. Hmm. Well, this could end up in an interesting legal limbo if uh, everything doesn't go as they plan. But let's hope it goes as it plans. Maybe they've already, like, secured the, the rights. Yeah, exactly. Eh, possibly. But they uh, was a deal, it's not a problem. If they get the money for it, and they say no, then there's going to be some problems. Yeah, I understand, though, the Kickstarter was just to show the company that there was interest in producing these discs, so... Eh, I may have to do some more reading in the next week. That may have been a condition, like, yeah, we'll help you out with this, but you gotta, you know, prove you can get the, the money is there. Well, that's true. God damn, it sounds like a Schwarzenegger film out there. <laughs> Commando? <laughs> uh, that or Total Recall. It's already set off car alarms twice. <laughs> I would like to speak, but I'm not sure I should yet. Just wait for the gunfire to die down. <laughs> <laughs> One black person in the neighborhood, and they just have to come out guns a-blazing. <laughs> uh, also, we've been following the Kickstarter of Space Bastards. The story of an accountant who decides to change his luck by becoming an interstellar mail person, and he finds out that delivering the mail is a bloody and lethal encounter. Uh, It ended on October 24th, yesterday. Had a goal of $5,000. Ended with 152 backers and $6,020. They get to make their graphic novel. Awesome. This is one of those independent books I'm sure people will look at on the shelves and just wonder, what the hell's a space bastard? (laughs) 
I admit, though, I'd probably read it. Uh, speaking of comic books, there's also Zombies Hate Kung Fu. <laughs> One just springboards right into the next. Uh, it's a story about zombies and two martial artists. If I have to get any deeper than that, I seriously suggest you go back to grade school. Uh, it has 14 days to go and ends on November 9th. It has 150 backers, a goal of 5,000 pounds. It currently stands at 3,731 pounds. He still has a great shot at getting this done. I wonder if he has previous history, though. Of Kickstarters, I should say. You know, similar to that uh, FUBAR Presents Mother Russia, they had a history of all kinds of books they produced. Mm. Well, well, it's being done by Ricky Marcel Pitcher of uh, United Kingdom, so hopefully he gets what he needs to. And uh, last week we brought up Nelvana of the Northern Lights, the Kickstarter for Canada's first superhero and comic book. Mm -hmm. They want to reprint uh, books that haven't been seen in print since 1941. They still have six days to go, ending on November 1st. A goal of $25,000. 895 backers has gotten them $44,917 Canadian. Well, I think it's a done deal. That is more than a done deal. You know, that they is, really want their yeah. Uh, heroin. Yeah, that means they can not just produce it, they might be able to actually uh, pay somebody to heroin. do it. That came out wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I I blame all the cop dramas I watch. <laughs> Too much CSI. <laughs> NCIS, but... <laughs> the difference is two letters. Um, no, actually one letter. Hmm. It is late. Crap. <laughs> uh, also, last week we started following A Hero's Death, a graphic novel, <laughs> graphic novel by Mark Texaria and Ricardo Sanchez. Uh, it's being produced out of San Francisco. The Kickstarter has 12 days to go and ends on November 7th. Currently has 281 backers, a goal of $10,000, and currently sits at $12,502. So this is an original graphic novel that's going to see the light of day. And Mark Tex area, he is a relatively big deal. He did a lot of painted books like the uh, when the Ghost Rider returned a couple of years ago. Yeah, I actually enjoyed his work, although it was creepy to read. Creepy can be good. When it's Ghost Rider, I assume that's what you're going for. And uh, something we discussed last week that Steve found interest in is called Not a Villain Book 2. <laughs> a comic book about a hacker who's investigating what, uh, whether or not she accidentally caused a global apocalypse. Uh, it has 15 days to go and ends on November 9th. Currently sits with 137 backers, a goal of $8,000. It's at $4,960. What would you call that? 50-50 shot? Yeah. Maybe even a little lower. 40-60. Mm. We'll see. It's, it's being presented by Anika of St. George, Utah. Uh, she's already produced the first book. This is the second book in this uh, storyline. So, I don't know if the first one is a web series or what, but hopefully she finds her footing. And last week we also, for the first time, brought up Stray. Uh... Kickstarted comic book by Vito Del Sante of Woodside, Queens, New York. He has 13 days to go. It ends on November 8, 2013. Currently sits with 200 backers, a goal of $8,000, and it has reached $7,431. I'd say he has a better than average shot. Uh, this is a story about a sidekick who returns to solve the murder of his mentor, but will he take over his, mentals, his mentor's mantle or become his own hero, basically? I think of it kind of like, um, you know, the typical story, of what if Robin had to investigate Batman's death? Kind of the same thing. Yeah. Except mm -hmm. not as many elegant and non-lethal uh, tactics. You know, I'm looking at a picture of the character, and he's carrying what looks like an extendable staff in the shape of a bone. That's made for beating people up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is an interesting turn. Remember we discussed last week, I brought up that uh, someone was trying to resurrect some fan films called Super Mario Brothers Z? Yeah. The Kickstarter's been cancelled. What? Somebody got word of it. It's now the subject of an intellectual property dispute. Oh, Ooh. ouch. Yeah, I, I so, saw that coming. So somebody was trying to continue someone else's fan films posthumously. The original creator died, and now it's been shot completely down. I almost wonder if the uh, videos are still on YouTube. They've probably been found by now. Mm-hmm. And uh, V brought to us last week, Unwritten, Echoes of Twilight. 
a single-player, open-world, open-play fantasy RPG where the player's choices determine the direction, flow, and outcome of the game. It, uh... It's sitting in dire straits, is the best way to put it. It has 69 hours to go and ends on October 28th. Currently sits with 631 backers, a goal of $500,000, and stands at $45,535. Yeah. That's that's not good odds. Someone would have to pay a heck of a lot of money right now. Or basically own the game. Well, Super Mario Brothers Z is still on YouTube. Yeah, they probably didn't advertise this well, like, or at all. <laughs> I couldn't imagine so. I mean, a lot of these things, even with uh, worse concepts than this, have gotten fully funded with similar amounts. So I just imagine they didn't attack this the right way. Speaking of, uh, Brandon brought us the Kickstarter for Split, the world's only earbuds with no string attached, cordless earbuds. Uh we talked a little bit about the confusion on that one last week. Well, it seems that confusion has pervaded the internet. Uh, Greenwing Audio's Kickstarter ends on October 31st in just five days. has 419 backers, a goal of $435,000, and sits at $58,583. The odds of this one sinking are fairly high. But we also discussed why people would buy or $170 earphones just because they're cordless. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I need the core because my ears are small. These things tend to fall out a lot. Earbuds, I should <laughs> say, not my ears. Yeah. So, I, I just say for that price, I'm, I would rather have a full set of Beats Audio. Yeah, I don't... If, if you have an earbud, they need to have something that they don't disappear, like, forever. Yeah. At that size... You know, a loss of Opso could, yeah, a loss of could swallow it, and I would never want to see it again. And uh, V brought something up today, or I should say yesterday. The f- it's kind of a first for me because I've never heard of a Kirk starter. <laughs> what? It's a Kickstarter for Star Trek Continues. It's a web series. Hmm. It's a fan series continuing the original adventures of the Star Trek Enterprise crew. You know, Kirk, Spock, and them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, it has 11 days to go and ends on November 6th. It has 1,700 backers, a goal of $100,000, and sits at $80,778. I haven't done the math, but that seems like a lot per backer. It would almost seem to indicate that the average amount backed would be somewhere to the tune of about $4,000. I don't think that's likely. But it could just be a lot of people just going above and beyond. They have had at least one backer for 2000 Actually, they've had uh, at least two different backers for $2,000 by themselves. Each. But this is kind of in an interesting place because apparently CBS likes fan-based productions of Star Trek series. Hmm. Really? Yeah, they apparently have no issue letting people do what they want to do with the series as long as they're not drawing a profit. Yeah. it It's an interesting idea... Um, the I'm a little uncertain based on the pictures, anyway, of the people that they're casting for this. But well, given the source material it's based on, though, you can probably get away with a lot of artistic license. Yeah, fair enough. Oh, <laughs> and I just saw a pretty one. So okay, <laughs> she found what she likes in there. <laughs> and uh, in my various seeking through things, I found an Indiegogo that's at least relatively of my interest, I guess. Uh, tentacle grape? <laughs> tentacle grape! <laughs> That's almost as good as the grapest. <laughs> it's a grape I, uh... soda that was produced, first I heard of it, was in uh, in partnership with Cosplay Deviants at the 21st Anime Expo, which I believe was 2012. Uh, it is a homebrew grape soda, complete with a schoolgirl and a purple fuku being wrapped in a tentacle and being offered grapes by it. I can't describe that any better. Uh, <laughs> their Indiegogo page is 36 days left. It'll end on November 30th, a goal of $20,000, and they're currently sitting at $773. Uh, it just started today, though. And for the money, that what they want to do is reformulate the soda and make it cheaper to buy. It is about $2 a bottle right now. Uh, they want to use sugar cane instead of high fructose corn syrup and a couple other items. Good for them. Uh, 
You know, there is no way to say tentacle grape and not have a big smile on your face just because he's that <laughs> damn stupid. I named a Keldean ke- tentacle grape. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <fuck. sighs> Look at where we go. It's not hard. <laughs> Wait, are know, you talking about the tentacle? I mean... <laughs> there, there was... Uh... Who who drew that picture of of uh, uh, Ihario and and uh, and Casey's Keldian with the tentacle rape? I know nothing about this. Neither do I. Oh, I think that was Mike. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay, that was hilarious. Suddenly, I feel like I need an adult. <laughs> um, the last Kickstarter we have is one we've been discussing on and off with at varying levels. The City of Titans Kickstarter. It has nine days to go and ends on November 4th, and Missing Worlds Media is just chugging along on this one. They th- they have 3,511 backers, a goal of $320,000, currently sitting at $482,989. They stand a pretty good chance of hitting that 500000 before this is said and done. Yeah. And what was the stretch goal for five hundred thousand? Wasn't that Aura's? Uh, I believe so. Hold on, let me see. I'm trying to find it. Ah, uh, here we go. Two. It's not just Aura's. They'll add new traveling powers, including acrobatic leaping, sky surfing via cloud, <laughs> magic carpet, boulder, manhole cover, etc. Oh, that'd be and, pretty cool. And swinging. And I assume they mean web swinging and not uh, Hugh Hefner swinging. <laughs> <laughs> but that, yeah, web swinging would be amazing. Can you just imagine that? <laughs> Oh, I'm, I'm so clones. I'm stoked for the for the wall crawling too. Oh, I didn't yeah, see wall true. crawling in there. Did you, where did you see that at? Oh, did I? I imagined it then. Okay, yeah, yeah I, I saw. I saw empty. swinging. It would be crazy if they had a. Uh, how would I? T- how do I? What's the term for this? When you when you can turn in, turn into like slime or something squishy, and get through things. <laughs> Yeah, meta- I'll, I'll go with metamorphosis. Other than that, it's yes. just massive amounts of masturbation. <laughs> <laughs> it was not even... <sighs> I know that's not where you're going, but, you know, when you say turn into slime and start moving in between things, I, I'll, you know, I don't think of women doing that. Just guys and having lots of fun with themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Moto stretch. <laughs> I will never get over that stupid ad. <laughs> not ever. <laughs> Japanese Japanese people really need to focus. They could have cured cancer by now. I know they could have. They could have shut down that stupid plant toys. by now. <laughs> uh, we'll go ahead and move into the news. Uh, first off, we have video game news. Uh, the, the biggest things that came out today were Arkham Origins and Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag. Uh, Arkham Origins, before the game came out uh, at the beginning of the week, they leaked the last two uh, assassins that's going to be chasing Batman through Gotham on Christmas Eve. Those were Killer Croc and Lady Shiva. How does Killer Croc write an assassin? He doesn't. (laughs) I mean, maybe it's a game and everything, but I would always think you hear this thing coming. I don't know. (laughs) I didn't write the stupid thing. And uh, did you guys hear that there was a mobile version of this game? No. No. It came out earlier this week, somewhere around Monday or Tuesday. It's called uh, Arkham Origins Mobile. Uh, it's not being rated very well. Newsarama called it a distraction during the countdown to the console edition. Hmm. They rated it 6 out of 10. Hmm. Uh, I don't know much beyond that because mobile gaming still is not something I pay much attention to. I, I play Candy Crush and Robot Unicorn Attack and I kind of leave it at that. I don't even do that. <laughs> <laughs> Yet. Well, the news for Arkham Origins, the the early sales and reviews seem to be pretty brisk and very high. Apparently, if you're a fan of either of the previous Arkham games, you're going to be a fan of this one. Uh, the only problem is it doesn't show you much of new. It has a lot of this... If you found issues with the last couple games, you'll find a lot of the same issues in this one. Uh, the boss fights are a little more robust, but that's about the only major change. News isn't all good, though, because multiple versions of Arkham Origins have been delayed in the UK. Ew. Uh, They've been pushed all the way back to November 8th. Two weeks from today. 
Damn. All other versions of the game are going to uh, come out on time. But the Wii U, PC, and 3DS versions of Arkham Origins were all pushed back. So if you own a computer or a Nintendo in the UK, you've been fucked. There isn't even any information to determine what in the hell happened. Hmm. What else can you call that except a monumental clusterfuck? Mm. I don't know if the UK is a big market for games, but I mean, they could buy the same language games we could, so I don't see what the issue is in getting it out that much later. Uh, probably something to do with the region locking thing. That could be. Yeah. That's still stupid. Mm. Speaking of stupid, Infinity uh, Ward, the uh, the makers of the Call of Duty franchise, uh huh. they were quoted as saying that Call of Duty players aren't hardcore gamers. Interesting. <laughs> The executive uh-huh. producer of uh, Infinity Ward, Mark Rubin, he told, uh, let me see, OXM, that he didn't expect the imminent arrival of the next generation of consoles to have much of an impact on Call of Duty's audience. And then he starts talking. He says, quote, regardless of platform, people's gaming habits aren't going to change just because there's a new platform. We have an enormous amount of players who are more in the casual game space, but they play a lot. It's kind of a weird, ironic thing to say. They aren't hardcore gamers, or even gamers, but they play Call of Duty every night. And those guys are going to continue to play regardless of platform. So I think not only will we continue to engage with the existing player base, but we'll take the next gen and see how far we can go with it, unquote. Hmm. Huh? This is something that they talked about on uh, Mission Start not too long ago, and I, personally, think that's fucking stupid. Not that they talked about it, just this man's remarks. Because my personal feeling is the number of games you play doesn't uh, doesn't qualify you as a hardcore gamer or not. It's passion. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if, if these guys, if your audience is playing each one you, you send out, they have passion for your games. They are hardcore Call of Duty players. That makes them hardcore gamers. Just because maybe the only other thing in the library is Wii Sports and possibly a, uh, you know, I don't know, freaking Animal Crossing or, uh, you know, Injustice. But they're still gamers. These yeah. are still hardcore gamers. And that'd be kind of disappointing to learn that Call of Duty players aren't hardcore gamers. I played some of those games. Does that mean I have to turn in my card even though I have, like, probably 100 games in my library? I just think that's a retarded statement. Yeah. I was thinking that motion. Someone put their foot in their mouth. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to shove mine deeper in with it. <laughs> uh, there is another game coming out called Titanfall. It's being done by Respawn Entertainment. Uh, Electronic Arts announced that the uh, debut game by th- by this will be on store shelves beginning March 11th, 2014. It's kind of an interesting concept in that it's not just an FPS like you would expect. Because Titanfall indicates either soldiers or, uh... Soldiers or, what do you call it? Uh, mech warfare? Mm, yeah. This game is both. Ooh. What happens is you have light mechs that are capable of running and obviously do heavy fire. Oh, but when you're I outside of, of the machine, your characters can do almost parkour-style actions and jump on the back of these mechs to either disable them or take them over. Ooh, I'm cool with that. Yeah, from what I understand, uh, the mech comma is a, is a merger between, you know, Western and Eastern... Uh, philosophies. From what I understand, yeah, the first couple of videos have been released have been very compelling. Uh, I'd, I'd like to see what the beta is before I make any final decisions, but this at least is very much on my radar. Yeah, I, my problem with mech games has always been I don't really want to be controlling a mech the entire time. Or yeah, well, in this time. case, you I can like be the road. Them. Yeah, in this case, you can be the rodent pulling out wires and really pissing somebody off. Yeah, that sounds fun. Go rat trap. <laughs> And uh, I did not know that the PS4 was going to have such a high price tag in Brazil. You could Ooh, pay yeah. over $1,800 to get one in Brazil. Yeah, gotta love tariffs and uh, import yep. costs. That's exactly it. Brazil has such an insane amount of import fees that you're paying four times the price of the machine by the time you get it in your hands there. But the PS4 is not nearly as expensive over there. It shouldn't be. But uh, it does make me curious about picking up a few on retail and just putting them on eBay for crying out loud. (laughs) That'd be a way to make a little money. Hmm. I I feel so sorry for these people that they have to go through so much, though, just to play video games. 
Do you wonder if these are just uh, in houses that have marble floors, or if groups of people are pooling money to get one? I don't know. <laughs> Interesting. Oh, that's got to be such a headache. Yep. Well, from there we'll move into uh, movie news. Kevin Feig, we talked about him for a little bit. He's a guy that runs uh, Disney's Marvel movie franchises and keeps them kind of on point and in storyline. His contract has been extended through the Phase 3 movies. And not only that, he has talked about the possibility of the Punisher and Daredevil being uh, used in those movies. Hmm. Uh, his quote was, We're trying to figure out what to do with Daredevil now. Punisher could show up at some at one point. You know, once we get characters back into the Marvel fold, we don't want to do something right away. And we don't want to and we want to do the smart thing at the smart time, unquote. Hmm. That indication is that it sounds like neither character is gonna get their own series or movie. It sounds like they'll show up as characters in someone else's film. Mm. Which is All not right. necessarily bad, because as I heard what they said uh, the news came out later this month that they're definitively working on at least a Black Panther movie for Phase 3. Could be interesting. So, well, yeah, and I, after a little bit of thinking, you know, both characters, Daredevil and Punisher, could fit into that movie. Mm-hmm. As both antagonists and protagonists. <laughs> well, frankly, you know, the Black Panther's had his beef with all three, at, or the other two at one point or another, but the Punisher never really sees eye to eye with people. That's just not the way he rolls. Yeah, well, makes sense. (laughs) She's trying to add. Uh, And uh, let me see, the Marvel Studio president, or the president, has uh, hinted at a build-up to Avengers 3 as the Infinity Gauntlet storyline. Ooh. Now, a lot of it is speculation. But uh, Feg said regarding the Infinity Gauntlet and uh, chasing something called the Aether in... uh, Thor the Dark World quote well I don't know that I could spell that out clearly necessarily but certainly fans of the comics could surmise that all of this is leading somewhere that Joss's decision to have Thanos turn around and smile for the audience at the end of, the, of Avengers was our reveal was always the plan unquote and then he kept going into what he called MacGuffins in the Avengers and Thor 2 and also something is going to tie into Guardians of the Galaxy the quote was and where it goes from there we'll see but yes, the MacGuffin of Guardian certainly plays into MacGuffins of the past. Unquote. Hmm. The phrase MacGuffins, what that means is for an object in a movie that everyone is chasing after. In other words, the goal. Hmm. So in other words, whatever is going to be fought over in the Guardians of the Galaxy may lead into things that, uh, that have been mentioned in previous movies, but then may uh, also lead into movies that haven't yet uh, come out. There's a lot of curiosity going back and forth, and now I'm very curious to see the the next Thor film, since it seems like something in that movie is going to play into what's coming in the Guardians of the Galaxy. Damn. I mean, I've seen hints of the Infinity Gauntlet in in the first wave of of the stuff. Well, yeah, the Gauntlet was actually in, uh, was it Odin's uh, treasure chamber? Yep, and the the gem Loki used in Avengers was, uh, was rumored to be the uh, mine, uh, uh, the mind gem from the the Infinity mind gem, Gauntlet. yeah, yeah. Well, it was the same color, certainly. Yep. So there is a lot of curiosity as to what's going on here because, in addition, this week we found out that Ben Kingsley's back at Marvel Studios. What? You guys okay. remember who that is? Yeah, yeah. He, he played a uh, mm-hmm. Mandarin. Sort of. Yeah. I mean, it's not a spoiler at this point that he wasn't exactly the Mandarin. He was an actor called Trevor Slattery. The play is the Mandarin. Yes. Uh, he was at a presser for Ender's Game, and Kingsley let this slip. Quote, it's a secret Marvel project. I'm not allowed to say any more. You're going to have to wait and see. I was with many members of the crew that were involved in Iron Man 3. It was lovely to see them again. It was great to be with this wonderful family. I think they have enormous taste as creative artists. There's nothing lazy or gratuitous about their work. They're at the top of their game and they're great company to keep, unquote. Huh. Uh, somebody asked Kevin Feig about that and he confirmed it through a lack of denial and he joked that there would be repercussions for the reveal. So they've actually got this guy back doing something else. Hmm. I, I just want to know, 
I'm curious to know what story you could have for this washed up meth meth head actor. Maybe that's the act. Uh, I it seems a little too perfect for me. But it could be he shows up as a, a cameo in another film just as a connection in joke. Yeah. Would be a good lock in for something like Ant Man for sure. Mm. <laughs> Uh, recently, Empire uh, Magazine put out 12 new images from the Days of Futures Past uh, filming. It has some interesting images in here, including Magneto. looks like he's using his helmet as a uh, blunt instrument and sending it flying through a window for some reason. He's done that before, I believe. Yeah. Uh, several pictures of Wolverine, young Magneto, and young uh, Professor Xavier standing in a room, it appears. And it looks like Magneto's a prisoner. And uh, another picture that kind of is a throwback of Xavier and Magneto sitting uh, across from each other at a chessboard. Although this time, there appears to be a bottle of rather fine whiskey between them. <laughs> That's awesome. Go figure. We'll make sure to link that gallery. It's from newsarama.com. And uh, also, there is a full trailer for X-Men Days of Futures Past coming out on October 29th. Hmm. So That's can, just a couple of days away. Right. They've already uh, set out a short teaser that's only six seconds long with several images, but the full trailer is only next week. So I'm in the mood to wait. Uh, the early Thor reviews are relatively positive, but a bit mixed. Uh, nine... Always. Well, 11 reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. Nine of them had uh, positive reviews, and so far it's gotten an early score of uh, 82%, which is pretty good by their standards. Uh, I don't know a lot about it because I'm trying to avoid a lot of it. However, they say that the last fight scene apparently has a lot of ingenuity and surprises in it. That's good. You always want a Thor good climax. Thor doesn't usually have ingenuity and surprises. It's just sort of like hammer smash. Yeah. Well, his surprise is that you just say, okay, I'm, I'm not holding back anymore. That's a surprise. You well, think, oh, fair go. enough. The, the quote from Newsarama says that it's in this. it's set in a city of uh, London with ever-telegenic Greenwich coming to the fore, and yes, it features two powerful foes knocking seven shades out of each other, but this isn't the city-smashing snooze fest that Meyer Man of Steel's climax. Instead, it's tricksy and inventive, constantly wrong-footing not just the audience, but its combatants to great and often genuinely hilarious effect. Nice. nice. Looking forward to hilarious it. Hilarious is good. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Me and- too. And uh, Marvel continues its media onslaught with not just a poster for Captain America Winter Soldier, but the full trailer was released this week. Oh, that was that was beautiful. I loved it, it. It had several images in it, including a Black Widow sporting her third haircut in as many movies. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Captain America apparently in a new uniform, more reminiscent of his uh, post what was it post heroic age uh, super soldier outfit, and uh, also had a quick quick glimpses of the Falcon. It appears that Robert Redford, we mentioned him months ago as being in the movie. I think he's the villain. Hmm. It looks like he's one It looks like he's one of those I'm saving the world by any means necessary types, even if that means expanding shield with uh, it looks like about 8 helicarriers and sending them as a global task force. Those are the oh. best. So this one may be uh, Captain America, Black Widow and the Falcon going up against a uh, US government marauding and trying to take on shield themselves. Uh, another part of the trailer looks like Nick Fury's been knocked out of action by the Winter Soldier himself. Hmm. And uh, something I did catch throughout the movie was that there were scenes of a helicarrier in several points with the number 42 on it. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, 42, I thought that was kind of interesting considering that's the one they kept using. That number has an extreme connotation in the recent Marvel Universe because that was the number of the uh, the final plan that Tony Stark... Uh, Hank Pym and Reed Richards used to jail any heroes that didn't go along with the Registration Act back in the Civil War. Ah. Uh. So to find that 42 so prominently on this helicarrier that's part of S.H.I.E.L.D.'s new task force, I thought that was kind of interesting. I don't know if it was purposeful, but I caught it. And, uh, ha <laughs> this is not something I expected to say. Disney is producing a new Avengers anime. Anime? anime for Japanese TV. It's called <laughs> Marvel Disc Wars, The Avengers. This is about as teen anime as you can get. Several young boys are playing a game that involves using uh, power discs 
with uh, warriors on them to fight each uh -huh. other. And somehow several Marvel heroes, including the Hulk, Iron Man, Thor, and Captain America, have been bonded to these discs, and they're using them to fight. Hmm. Yeah, I, I'm my, looking at... my hearing is really going tonight, because it only now occurs to me that you didn't say disc whores, you said disc wars. <laughs> Everyone hears what they want to hear. I, I suppose. <laughs> But uh, I, I I don't know what to say about this, except I imagine it could be relatively successful because it falls in the same vein as Pokemon and Beyblade and Digimon and anything else where you have someone who's basically 12 fighting someone else who's 12 using monsters or other creatures. I'm looking at this picture of this and it's like... I know, the promo picture I find kind of funny because the Hulk looks like some kind of sumo wrestler gone insane. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, other uh, Marvel affiliated news uh, as Jesse said uh, the Star Wars Episode 7 has had a shake up uh, they have lost their writer uh, the Oscar winning tribe originally picked to write it Michelle Arndt who was on uh, Little Miss Sunshine he has been replaced by Lawrence Kasdan and J.J. Abrams himself Hmm. Yeah. Uh, the sequel apparently is still on schedule to begin shooting in spring in Britain. I still wonder, though, it's never a good sign when writers are suddenly tossed out mid-production. So I don't know if that was some kind of disagreement between Abrams and Arndt as to where things should go, or if this is some kind of deeper issue. Does I'm Abrams not... have a history of butting heads with people? I don't Ooh. know. I've never looked that deeply into his history. The only one I've known that could be problematic is Michael Bay. Well, yeah. He's Michael Bay. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll see if I can find out any more as it goes along, but something tells me that uh, Disney's going to be very careful to keep information from getting out of on whatever yeah. change this is. Yeah. Uh, in DC media news, uh, remember how the Green Lantern series was taken off the air and replaced by a CG Batman series? Yeah. Yeah. Apparently, he's already been pulled from Cartoon Network. Oh, good. Uh, Batman. Okay. Yeah. In a tweet that was in a tweet that was re released by Nick and Moore, it says here, "quote In what seems like DC Nation deja vu, new episodes of Beware the Batman have been pulled from Cartoon Network next weekend." Repeats too. Uh, this was sent out back on October nineteenth. They didn't even advertise on the station that they were replacing the show. They literally just said, "This sucks. It's gone." Yeah, no, there's no loss there. Uh, I don't. I, I never personally watched an episode of it. I saw the promos and just didn't care. But I, w I wonder if people are going through Batman fatigue. Probably. There's a lot of Batman stuff recently. Yeah. Every time you restart it, you always ask yourself the same question: Well, when's the Joker coming? When's Bane coming? Is that the Penguin or is that just another fat man? And is Alfred ever going to get out the goddamn cave? <laughs> this one did. Yeah, but apparently it wasn't enough. I guess another mistake was they had his young partner as Katana instead of a Robin or a Batgirl. Yep. Now, this was very loosely connected to anything that came before, which is arguably good, but they've, they've painted themselves into such a corner as to what people expect from Batman these days. If you don't have certain things, people get pissed off. You try anything new, it's just weird. I don't think it helps that the, the first villain they had was Professor Pig. What if Batman was female? You, you mean like... Like Batwoman? <laughs> yes. Then she'd be gay and DC would never allow that. At least not on TV. <laughs> no, she just can't get married. That's still fucking stupid. Yeah. Uh, ben Affleck talked a little bit about uh, Batman expectations and surprises. Uh, he didn't say a lot that you wouldn't already expect. Uh, regarding what he said about the role, he says, quote, Initially, I was reluctant, as I felt I didn't fit the traditional mold, but once Zack showed me the concept and that it would be both different from the great movies that Chris and Christian made, but still, in keeping with tradition, I was excited. Doing something different and new is always tricky and part of the thrill and the risk as, initially, as it initially confounds expectations. The truth is, it's the movie and the execution of it is what all the actors depend on, and I believe in Zack's vision, unquote. I'm not a Zack Snyder fan. I haven't found a whole lot of movies he's done that I consider really interesting. But I 
I appreciate at least that Ben Affleck is coming out swinging and trying to produce at least a decent film. He's not my yeah. favorite actor either, but for crying out loud, at least he's trying. He, he just... seems like a decent person. From the interviews, it does seem like he likes to joke around. It just seems like he found his acting legs a little later than everyone expected. You know, when he's doing other people's comedies, he seemed to be floundering a little bit, but when he started doing dramatic roles, he did step yeah. up. Especially when he started directing them. He seems to have a pretty specific idea as to what to do. Wow. And uh, Warner Brothers CEO Kevin Sujihara, he was questioned again about DC's media and the possibility of a Wonder Woman movie. His quote was, We are taking it all very seriously and are trying to do a plan that is respectful to those characters and maximizes the stories as best they can. So everything that has been speculated are things that we've thought about. Unquote. Hmm. That's a pretty interesting answer, no answer. He didn't say anything. No, he didn't. You know, it's lawyer speak. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, speaking of uh, DC movies, Stan Lee would like to have a cameo appearance in Batman vs. Superman. <laughs> <laughs> now, keep in, mi- uh, keep in mind, he had nothing to do with the creation of any of these characters, but as he put it, quote, I'll show you why DC isn't so smart. If I were the head of DC, I would contact me and say, how about doing a cameo in the next Superman movie? Can you imagine? Nobody would believe it. Everyone would go see it, unquote. <laughs> you know what? People would probably. I know, I'd be curious to see where he'd pop up in there. That'd be funny. <laughs> you can bet if they did that unannounced, people would lose their minds as soon as that scene came up. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he also said he wasn't a great fan of 3D, but that's not, that's not really a surprise. I mean, as he put it, 3D was out in his era all those years ago, and it really didn't do much back then either. Yep. Oh, and uh, remember for a while we were using the music of Adam Warrock on the show? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. He came out with a new song. He calls it BSFX. Uh-huh. It's a song about uh, how if you get in his face, basically he'll go uh, Batman sound effects on you. <laughs> <laughs> Bam, boom, pal. Awesome. We'll we'll link it. You guys can make your own decision. I th- I thought it was just one of those interesting things to throw out there at the very least. Yeah, that was actually one of the things I was a little disappointed Jesse didn't bring up in it with their interview with uh, Chris was his idea for an aura. Well, um, they invited us for a follow up, so maybe we'll have to bring that up. Ooh, Ooh. nice. So, the, um, really. The, Yes, the quote from the media runner over at City of Titans was that Chris had a great time on the show and looks forward to doing it again. Awesome. awesome. I definitely enjoyed it. Yeah, I, me too. I, so did I. It was a lot of fun, and I'm just glad we didn't embarrass ourselves or him. Oh, I don't know. I, I'm pretty sure I embarrassed myself at one <laughs> point or another, but it's all fun. Well, it's never a day that ends in a Y if you don't. <laughs> uh. In general movie news, probably one of the biggest things that came out is uh, Bruce Campbell, the guy that's appearing at Kamikaze uh, next weekend on November 2nd. Uh-huh. He has signed on to return as Ash in Army of Darkness 2. Oh, damn. <laughs> that, that could be quite amusing. Well, he spoke at Wizard World Nashville about it, and his quote was, The last one was 22 years ago. I just haven't been racing to do it. Sam Raimi is just a little bit busy making the biggest movies in Hollywood. I used to be busy, now I'm not, and that's why I'm here. (laughs) Ash would have to stop occasionally from chasing some deadite to catch his breath. Maybe we could do that, I guess. That would be exciting, fighting a walker. That would be alright, hit them with my cane, fake them out, have a fake heart attack, distract a zombie. I like it. (laughs) Seriously, the answer is yes. That's about as Bruce Campbell as you can expect. Yep. Yeah. He has Good old some, Bruce. He has to do something now that burn notice is over. Yeah. Don't tell me about it. <laughs> wow. I haven't finished it yet. Really? It's been you like haven't? six weeks. No. I. One of the many things that I'm falling behind on. All right, before we make her cry. <laughs> uh, this is something that's going to make her cry tears of laughter. 
Michael Dorn is confirmed he's working on a Star Trek Captain Worf TV series. What? <laughs> Captain oh Worf. It's on and off. It, it gains steam and loses steam, apparently, the way he describes it. But his quote was, I come up with the idea because I love Worf, and I think he's a character that hasn't been fully developed and hasn't been fully realized. Once I started thinking about it, it became obvious to me that I wanted to at least put it out there, which I have, and the response has been pretty amazing. We've been contacted by several individuals. I can't say who and all about that, but uh, wanting to come on board and be a part of this. Interestingly enough, it has gotten traction. I was very surprised. I was on a movie not too long ago where one of the producers was basically lobbying to be a part of it. He was like, Michael, I'd love to write it if you haven't. So at this point, my agents and my manager are looking at all the avenues and trying to figure out which is the best one. My agent and manager have been in the business for a while, so they're very savvy about where to start and how to get it going. Like I said, in this business, you never know, and I've been through pitching things, and I never want to do that again. It's pretty brutal, but I definitely think, once again, if Paramount or CBS or anybody thinks this is a viable thing, they'll jump on it, unquote. That's rather interesting. My only question is, is he a captain in the Federation or as part of the Klingon Empire? I don't know. I just wonder if his captain... I don't know. I just wonder if his captain style is going to be kicking people in the Gekthor. He's captain of a Romulan. <laughs> Whoa! There must have that been a lot of that. ale on that deal. Yeah. No, no. He, no, he, no, hijacked, he hijacked the Defiant. He's just cruising around in that now. No, not ale. Prune juice. What did he say? Yes. There's one thing I agree with Worf on is prune juice. And his first lieutenant is his teenager pissy little son. Alexander, the uh, bad luck, good luck charm. Basically. <laughs> I still love that episode of DS9. <laughs> well, I don't, uh, well, uh, I don't recall that one. <laughs> we're going to nerd up in so many different ways. Yeah. Uh, moving on, James Cameron has found Avatar's Darth Vader. They've re-signed Stephen Lang to reprise his role as Colonel Miles Quartich in the yes. Avatar sequels. Dude. Yes. <laughs> Uh, some people would say, but he died. And according to James Cameron, quote, Stephen was so memorable in the first film, we're privileged to have him back. I'm not going to say exactly how we're bringing him back, but it's a science fiction story after all. His character will evolve into really unexpected places across the arc of our new three-film saga. I look forward to working with such a gifted actor who's also become a good friend, unquote. You know, I, I admit, I was sitting in the same place going, but you fucking died. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, but, it's sci-fi. Yeah, it is sci-fi. Yeah. It's, it's so, a clone! Yeah, he suddenly has a baboon's heart in its ass. Robot! No, wait, the first one was the clone. Now the real oh, one's it's... pissed and coming to get him. <laughs> it's his twin, twin brother. brother with a goatee. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> He's been brought back to life by some alien technology. Some a strange plant of fungi. All you need now is a guy in a suit in a tuxedo with a microphone from parts unknown. <laughs> and, uh, Dodgers in the twenty fourth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I'm sad with this next piece of news. I am a long term Jackie Chan fan. Oh, he may be a dick. What? What? <sighs> He said at a recent interview to uh, promote his uh, CZ-12 movie coming out in the U.S., he said this in California, that, uh, well, quote, Americans and Chinese shouldn't just join hands. The whole world should just join hands. Even saying this, I think it's best natural disasters befall a certain country like giant earthquakes and tsunami. In times like this, the world will join together to aid them, which is great. Without earthquakes and tsunami, nobody will do anything. Without them, people just engage in conflicts under political pretext, unquote. I don't think it's any secret what country he's referring to. Mm. <laughs> you know, even sideways, and I understand that China and Japan have had their issues over the years, that's a dick move. I don't know, maybe he's talking about China. <laughs> seriously doubt it at this point. You know, I don't think he would stand there and wait every time China shakes and go, Yay, Americans are coming! <laughs> you know, the, the man is so pro-China, I just, I couldn't see that. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's not like uh, anybody else would show up to help us out. We're the ones that keep sending everybody to go help everybody else out. They come and help us out. I'm sure a tank can put a building back up. Yeah, Canada yeah. would help. <laughs> yeah, they'd send us maple syrup. 
For all you know, that's what their buildings are made out of in the first place. <laughs> oh, that's made out of the maple tree. Oh, right, I forgot. They grind up moose. <laughs> the moose cavalry shall come and save us all. What? Uh, we, spoke <laughs> in, we spoke about uh, uh, Michael Bay a little bit earlier, and uh, just today, on October 25th, uh, some renders were released of Transformers 4 Age of Extinction. Turns out some of the rumors are definitely true, because these renders show uh, previews of, especially in one picture, Optimus Prime, Bumblebee, and a Tyrannosaurus. Hooray! Really? Yes. The head of a Tyrannosaurus is very clear behind the two of them. I actually found a video on YouTube that I posted to our Facebook earlier today of filming of Transformers 4 in Hong Kong. You see a bunch of Chinese people running in one direction down, down a street, and as soon as they're off screen, you hear this weird reverberating roar, and then they go running back the other way. <laughs> Eagle Zero! It's definitely something big and animalistic, so I'm guessing that the Dinobots are, are a shoe-in now. I have to admit, I'm kind of keen for that. I know, I was going to bow out of the fourth film, but Robot Dinosaurs? Shit, here's my 12 bucks. Yeah. I like the third one more than I like the second one. <laughs> Actually, I think I liked it more than the first one. I think liking the third one more than the second one is pretty easy. Yes. You know, there's something about wrecking ball balls that just really rubs me the wrong way. Uh, yeah. And I was rather unimpressed by Megan Fox. I like Megan Fox. I thought her blonde replacement was kind of dippy in herself. Yeah. You know, I like my eye candy to at least pretend it has intelligence. <laughs> uh, there was a... There have been, uh, there's been a blog post by uh, somebody who uh, accused Crunchyroll of profit-taking in the extreme. Hmm. Uh, they claimed that there was no way that people paying $10 a month was actually supporting the industry. To them, they thought it was better that you bought a DVD. That's actual support of the industry, the way they put it. Uh, Crunchyroll fired back by stating that they actually... Uh, a large amount of the money they take in does go directly to what you watch. The way they allocate it, though, is that uh, the 200000 or so of their paying customers, the money that they take in, obviously about $2 million, they allocate uh, per what you watch. In other words, the money you spend per month, it's not a flat fee that goes to people. It goes in sections depending on which shows you watch in a given month. Mm. That is awesome. I have wished for this right. and the, in the, the past o- year. <laughs> And the other part of the guy's argument was that, well, you still have about 900,000 people who aren't paying anything, and that's true. You have a lot of free subscribers on Crunchyroll. However, the uh, CEO explained, but we have advertising revenues that does go back to the uh, the creators of the shows. Okay. So he has reasonable explanations for everything at the very least. I almost wonder if this is going to be some kind of psychotic and stupid Twitter war in the, in the end. I'm not interested. <laughs> Move along. <laughs> Wow, okay. <laughs> not a Crunchyroll fan? No, I was not a, a fan of uh, Twitter. Wars. Oh, in other, in other words, uh, what do you call it? Inquiry answered, fuck you and go away? Yep. Okay. Uh, is anyone a fan of George Romero in the room? Who? George Romero. The infamous <laughs> creator of Night of the Living Dead. Oh. <laughs> okay. He's doing a comic book for Marvel, Empire of the Dead. It's kind of an evolution of his story in that zombies have actually taken over the Isle of Manhattan, and to uh, to stop them from spreading, they blew up the bridges and locked off the island. Well, in the time they've been left alone, they started gaining intelligence, and they're looking to negotiate now. Hmm. Huh. It's a, definitely a different take on it. But, I mean, George Romero's done like eight different zombie films. They, well, they all have a similar theme. Night of the Living Dead, Dawn of the Dead, Day of the Dead, Land of the Dead, Diary of the Dead, Survival of the Dead. And yeah, the only one I've seen is Dawn of the Dead. Yeah, and now he has Empire of the Dead. It's a 15-issue miniseries. The art's being done by Alex Maleev of Daredevil fame. Hmm. Uh, now I understand why i never heard of him. I've never seen any of these. Uh, I've heard of worse ideas for comic books. I mean, Slapstick had his own book for a while. <laughs> Uh, in legal news for comic books, Jack Kirby's estate has been denied a rehearing in superhero rights. Uh, the heirs of the Jack Kirby estate have been suing that uh, 
uh, the his estate as uh, co-creator of the Avengers and X-Men were denied uh, an on-bank hearing on whether or not the estate had the right to issue termination notices to Marvel based on his characters in 2009. In other words, they want to take characters that uh, Kirby created at the time he worked for Marvel and suddenly say, we own those now and you can't use them. Uh, and the court said, no. I agree with the courts. You know, it's it's one of those things where I don't know the contract, but even way back when, there was a lot of uh, contract with creators that basically said anything you created while working for us belongs to us. That's not exactly a new practice. No. Yeah. <clears throat> so I imagine if uh, if the appeals court denied a rehearing, then that's that just about ends the whole thing unless they want to go to the Supreme Court with it, and I imagine they have a lot of better things to do than uh, than a copyright case. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know what their angle was, and I don't know what they saw, but they're definitely not going to get anything from it. And uh, there is a preview to uh, Superior Spider-Man 20 that Dan Slott doesn't want people to read, according to the promo. Should we... Hmm. I mean, for those who care, Madam Web is waking up from her coma. She's oh. been in it since the Spider Island storyline, since before Peter Parker died. Oh, fun. And she wakes up screaming that all the spiders will die. Oh, fun. <laughs> Is that your answer to everything? No, Spider-Man's coming back. Oh, fun. I have a flat tire. Oh, fun. I have just secular cancer. Oh, fun. I'm a simple man. That just proves how in- important inflection is. <laughs> Come on, Jeremy. What, what was your go-to answer for the longest time? Sizzler. That was my answer every time I was hungry or if I had to use a bathroom. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I, I guess it could be worse. Jeremy, we're having our third kid. Oh, fuck it all. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you got the third kid. Uh, <laughs> no, it, it, I only fucked one for that. It's true. Okay. <laughs> well, uh,. Here's something that's going to make V really happy. Uh, IDW is putting out a new Star Trek comic book series that has the return of Khan. Wow. Whether or not it's a wrath, I don't know. But <laughs> it's a five-issue limited series that's going to come out following the events of Into Darkness. It's going to be both what happened to him as well as going in-depth into his origins in the new universe. Hmm. That is actually really interesting. And we've sold some books. <laughs> And uh, in news that Jesse and uh, Steve may find relatively interesting, there is a limited edition print that's going to be uh, at the uh, Aspen booth at Kamikaze uh, during November 1st through the 3rd. They've taken some of Michael Turner's work on Aspen and they put in the Kamikaze octopus behind it. Hmm. So it's technically brand new Michael Turner work. Uh, I can't spend money. Not right now. <laughs> well, it's available only at the Aspen booth during the convention. Of course. Which means it'll be on eBay for twice the price a week afterwards. <laughs> also, of course. <laughs> There's actually a lot of uh, a lot of convention exclusives coming out this year through Kamikaze for the first time ever. People are getting into everything. Uh, we lost uh, kind of an animation great this week. Uh, Lou Scheimer died. Uh, he was the co-founder and president of Filmation Studios. You guys remember that uh, cartoon company? Oh, no, I don't. Yes. They did a titanic oh, amount uh, of work. He-Man, She-Ra, the Star Trek animated series, uh, the Archie animated series, oh, Star. Yeah, Fat Albert, uh, Fantastic Voyage. Yeah. Wow. I mean, Holy he did, crap. Yes, the man did a shit ton of stuff. And we no longer have him, unfortunately. Damn. Yep. There's not much else you can say, except he's obviously going to be missed. I have no idea what the hell I'm listening to. Sorry, I was opening windows and keeping track of things, and suddenly there, uh, some something opened in the background. But the Filmation d- did a few live-action series, too, including Space Academy and uh, The Secrets of Isis for, the, uh, for Shazam, you know, the DC version of Captain Marvel back in the 70s. I remember those. Yes. He unfortunately passed away. That, 
I, I can safely say that even though those were terrible cartoons, those were some of the first cartoons that uh, really forwarded my interest in animation. Especially things like Brave Star and the original Ghostbusters. Yeah, and you know what? Uh, it, without He Man, we wouldn't have had uh, the uh, He Man versus Lino. Uh, maybe it's better he's gone. <laughs> oh, come on. That was an amusing fight. Okay. Uh, general nerd news. Uh, uh, there is a map that V forwarded to me of the uh, the flow of radiation from the Fukushima plant into the Pacific Ocean. Oh, yeah. yeah that. that was kind of freaky. Yeah, we may have shark people soon. I think some of that may have been uh, exaggerated, however, hopefully. I think it's been exaggerated as a chance to wake people up, but that's still a serious problem when only in the yeah. last couple of weeks has Japan actually asked for help in shutting down this, what, 18-month problem now? Yeah. This is some serious shit. I mean, the, it's it's not just the, the fact that the, uh, the, uh, the block uh, around the waste... Uh, fuel for the reactor is cracked, but that groundwater is seeping in. When it's seeping in, that means it's either going out in the ocean or going into the ground. Mm-hmm. So, I'm of the mind right now that maybe we should just just put the whole damn thing under a dome and blow it up. The area around the reactor has got to be uninhabitable by now. Yeah, I would assume. Yeah, but it's not all... Basically, not all problems in the Pacific Rim are Japan's, because China has had smog blankets so thick, they had to close schools for a few days. They advise people to stay inside. Some of the pictures are what you would expect of, like, a foggy day in London, frankly. Damn. And only recently is the government saying, okay, we have to address this. This may be a problem. Really? I think we're about 20 years too late. Yeah, I mean, six months ago, I saw pictures that made uh, it, it look like a full fog. It looked like uh, the tops of buildings were peeking out of clouds, like something out of frickin' Blade Runner. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. So, now they think that it's extreme conditions and that the, there should be something done about it. Although, some of the areas where uh, this is basically stemming from is from high manufacturing. And they claim that the problem isn't necessarily manufacturing. The problem is there's been no strong wind and a level of high humidity in a in a time of the year where the uh, the farmers are burning excess crops. Uh, I seriously doubt that's your only problem. I hear, uh, yeah, I just hear excuses. Yeah. yeah. Fuck's sake. Maybe we should just dome the whole Pacific Rim. <laughs> uh, and this is kind of sad nerd news. There was a, a veteran, an Iraqi war veteran, Kimberly Walker, who unfortunately returned um, deceased. No. And she was interred at, uh, let me see, where was it? Spring Grove Cemetery. It's a historic cemetery in Ohio that includes a lot of veterans. And uh, she got her favorite animation character on her headstone. It, it's yep. a headstone that is SpongeBob SquarePants in an army uniform with a cap. Yeah, uh-huh. salute. And it's one of those that's things awesome. that's it's kind, of, it's kind of funny to look at, i got to admit. It lifts your spirits a little bit. They also made a similar headstone for her sister, who hasn't died yet, but she wanted to. Uh, she wanted a similar she's a memorial twin. to her. Uh, I'm sorry. I believe she's a twin. I, Either that or she's very close. I I know that they're close. I don't know about twin, but uh, a week after the uh, funeral for Kimberly Walker, both headstones were removed by the cemetery. Yep. They do not feel that these are appropriate for their historic cemetery, and they can't be displayed there. Now um, they have off- they have offered to pay for the replacements and to pay the cost of the original SpongeBob tombstones. Um, no, actually, uh, I have not heard that they offered to pay, pay the, uh, the cost of the originals. They did. This is according to the cemetery president. Okay. But um, you know, I, I think your guys' concern is the same as mine. Why in the fuck do you do this a week after? Well, okay. From what I read. Uh, Basically, the guy saying, oh, uh, the employee that you talked to was mistaken, uh, so we're not going to allow it. It's like, um, he's your employee. You have to honor that agreement. Mm-hmm. I understand that, and I understand the uh, the cemetery's position that the, it's a historic place and it needs, to, it needs to keep a certain decorum. However, the conversation should have happened before they took down the stones. Yes, exactly. 
Not to mention the fact that it should have happened when they were ordering the stones. Mm-hmm. I, I, I mean, it could be that the when the uh, when the employee said it, he thought everything was on the up and up, and the cemetery just wasn't aware until they were walking by one day and said, "What is this?" Well, I, I think that's probably the likeliest outcome, but, but that's the problem. Yeah, but still, if you employed this person and you gave him the authority to make these kinds of decisions. Mm-hmm. Don't be shocked that he makes them. Yeah, right. exactly. And, and don't sit there and pull a complete, you know, one eighty. And and you know, I quite frankly, I find it, you know, just completely, you know, bullshit. Yeah. Well, the, for those who are uh, for those who are confused, we're not talking about a simple placard with the image of SpongeBob on it. We're talking about a headstone in the shape of SpongeBob SquarePants. Yeah. And. Um, you know, I, I still think that the, the main issue, though, is that even if they had this issue, somebody should have been called before they simply removed the stones. That's that's a serious breach of etiquette to me. And yeah. I, I think out of all of the options they gave to fix it, uh, I believe one of the options they gave was instead of it being standing up as a normal headstone, they instead put it on the ground, you know, laying flat. Mm-hmm. Uh, that out of all the options seemed the most acceptable, but even still, it just... Well, the, the the changing of position wasn't in the story I read, simply the paying for the original and the replacements, but... Yeah, well, uh, the, just... the one that I read said uh, that they they would either do it that way or that they would just have a new headstone and have the SpongeBob figure engraved uh, somewhere on the headstone, but, you know, very small. Well... All I can say is that I imagine that eventually this will be removed and changed with something else. But, uh, you know, they would have to pay, at least in my case, the new stone, the old stone, and there would have to be something in the middle because they would really piss me off in between. There is some emotional yeah. damage there. Yes. And uh, we talked uh, before about bitcoins, the uh, virtual yeah. currency that is generated when you solve uh, complex mathematic equations. Uh-huh. Uh, when we first talked about them, about... I think two or three weeks ago they were at 140. With the closure of the Silk Road and uh, with Baidu really pushing these things, they have gone up to uh, 205 per Bitcoin. Wow. Uh, They previously peaked at 265 back in April of the year, but because of uh, the concerns about the the anonymity and how Bitcoins are sometimes used by uh, websites pushing illegal stuff, their value dropped a bit. Now it's rising back up. I would like to see one sort of currency we could trade across the planet. Not necessarily standardized as in we all use U.S. dollars or euros, but just something that makes it easier than, okay, I just ordered something from the U.K., I don't know how many pounds it translates to in dollars. Get your fingers out of my wallet. (laughs) I would just like to know one currency I could pay everything with. Yeah, I don't see a downside to that. And uh, did you hear that there was a couple who got married on the Pirates of the Caribbean ride? Really? Yes. Hmm. At Disneyland's Pirates of the Caribbean, this was possibly the sneakiest thing I've ever heard. The groom was dressed in Bermuda shorts and a tuxedo t-shirt. The fiancé was dressed relatively normally. What they did was they uh, a group of them and about 20 close friends got together, parsed themselves out in groups of three so nobody noticed them. And uh, one of them was a preacher dressed in relatively normal clothes. And when the ride started, they started the ceremony. <laughs> nice. So by the time they got off the ride, they were married. That's cool. Nice. That uh, has got to be one of the best weddings ever. Yeah, it's one of those daring things. And I think they're kind of fortunate that after Disney found out, they're not mad. You know, some companies react very strangely to strange things. Yeah. But fortunately, it doesn't appear that they've demanded any extra money or... Uh, or uh, asked him to do anything else. He just kind of gave him a quiet, well, good for you. Don't let it just fucking happen again. Just your firstborn child. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Mickey. <laughs> uh, and you can get a $75,000 uh, seat balloon ride. Okay. Uh, it is a balloon ride to near space. It will take you up 19 miles into the atmosphere. Mm, I think that would be a little cold. (laughs) And hard to breathe. Well, outer space starts at 62 miles, so yes, it's well above breathable atmosphere. 
I believe breathable atmosphere stops somewhere around 25,000 feet, if I remember correctly. But, uh, yeah, think of it as a unique ride. Uh, I don't remember what company... Oh, Worldview Enterprises is putting this up. So if you got 75000 to burn and you want to see a, a new viewpoint on the planet, there you go. <laughs> yeah, I guess they should just be really careful where they do this, though, because you know some jackass is going to shoot them down. Oh, they were spying. <laughs> everything is uh, everything is spying to certain countries. Well, uh, the Cassini probe? It found salt flats around Titan's northern lakes. Hmm. Hmm. Titan apparently has a lot of water-like substance on it, but surrounding that are salt flats, uh, which they detected by finding differences in the composition of surface materials around polar lakes. Now, Titan is the largest moon, but the lakes are not exactly water. It's liquid ethane and methane rather than water. Yep. Don't light a match. Yeah, so you can stand outside and get freaking high. <laughs> but still, it it makes it is interesting to find out, and at least if they ever decide to put a Titan colony up, they know where to put it. Let's just hope they don't piss off Thanos. <laughs> and uh, they scientists have discovered the most distant galaxy they've ever seen. It would take 13.1 billion years to get there. No, oh, it's just a... No, I'm sorry. It took 13.1 billion years for the light from the galaxy to get here. Oh. So, so yeah, unless we're moving at light speed. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's less than 2% the mass of the Milky Way, but it is producing stars at a rate that apparently is confounding scientists. It's marked as the galaxy Z8 underscore GND underscore 5296. Maybe they should hire some guys out at Marvel to name these things. <laughs> Too, too many letters, too many uh, numbers. Yeah, it was discovered by an international team of astronomers using Hubble. And uh, they were based out of the uh, Keck Observatory in Hawaii. <laughs> this is one of those things that I'm sure is not going to interest a whole bunch of people, but I think this is groovy. Yeah, uh, I find it interesting. Now, here's the thing. The, uh, the color in the spectrometer reading of this galaxy says it is rich in metals. It has a mass of one billion suns. 40 to 50 billion times less than the Milky Way. So it is a small galaxy, but it's apparently pumping out a high formation of stars. 330 Ah. solar masses per year. That's 100 times greater than what's put out in the Milky Way. So, uh, the lighting bills down there must be pretty low. (laughs) Oh, and uh, as if Japan didn't have enough issues with nuclear water and giant fucking hornets, they built a space cannon. <laughs> Anime fantasies begin because they apparently have built the beginnings of the wave motion gun. Uh, the uh. J- JAXA, the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, tested a weapon that they're going to add to uh, the uh, to a satellite module. And this cannon isn't going to be used to attack pirates, but it is going to be used to blast asteroids. The, the plan is, by creating an explosion of dust, they can measure the dust and find out what is inside asteroids instead of just doing surface scans. Huh. But it is described as a kinetic impact weapon. It relies on an explosive charge to launch a four-pound slug into the surface. The SDF-1, we have begun. <laughs> Well, not exactly a mass driver, but... Yeah. No, but it is a giant railgun in space. Yep. Uh, still a cannon. <laughs> and uh, for people who are going to London Super Cosplay Championship, it's at the Excel Center in London on March 16th and 17th, 2014. The prize is well worth entering. They will give you a fully funded trip to DragonCon 2014. Ooh. That includes uh, two round trip tickets, so you can take a friend and a five night stay in an Atlanta hotel, as well hmm. as two Dragon Con badges for all four days of the convention. Nice. So those of you in the UK looking for something to do and you can cosplay, this is something to do. <laughs> and uh, that's all of the news I have. What I asked everyone to do uh, before we got sidetracked with a big City of Titans interview was to find a couple books that they found interesting in DC's Villain Month and take a look through it and tell me what they think. And after we get done with that, we'll have a short discussion about the overall of uh, Forever Evil, the arc that involves villains taking over in the DC Universe. Uh, 
V, which ones did you pick out of this? I picked Poison Ivy and Lex Luthor. Oh, okay. Uh, man, start with Poison Ivy. Uh, what kind of origin story did she have? She was uh, in an abusive family, and her father killed her mother. Huh. And then she went and joined Wayne Ent- Enterprises. Wayne Enterprises. And, yes, and uh, took the proposal to Batman, <laughs> who was like, "No," and now you're fired. Now wait, she said, "Here, you winged freak, try this." Basically, it was something. Ba- it was some kind of uh, advertisement based on pheromones. Oh. So then she's all mad and she just eats it and drinks it all and turns into a monster. Isn't that how every conversation with women ends? I'm pissed off here, drink this. <laughs> <laughs> it was interesting. Now, this was a good origin story? Because that's very different from the one I used to know. Uh, I th- made sense to me. Okay. I mean, if the, all the motivations made sense and... Um, it was a little weird that she turned into this plant thing from a bunch of pheromones, but okay, I can see it. Okay, was it was it a good read, or was it rough, or...? I wasn't the biggest fan of the art style, mm-hmm. but they did, uh, like, there were a lot of flashbacks, and there was clear delineation between what was a flashback and what was not a flashback. Okay. Um, so, it was pretty easy to read, yeah, it... I was concerned it was going to not know what the hell was going on, since I don't know anything about Poison Ivy, but it actually made sense, so. Alright. And, uh, you read Lex Luthor. I tried. <laughs> <laughs> Uh-oh, that, that doesn't sound promising. What happened? Um. Ish. He's very verbose. <laughs> um, yeah. Did they write him as one of those people that has to impress you with his uh, Scrabble-like vocabulary? His ego was very apparent. Mm. Like, it was just oozing out of every sentence, which I, which is fine. It's just I had difficulty following it. So it sounds like this character has changed very little from the new 52. Probably not, yeah. Okay. Was that one a good read? Or it sounds like that one rubbed you kind of the wrong way. Um, I think if I knew more about Lex Luthor, I would have been able to get into it. But oh, okay, so this didn't function like the jump-on point DC had hoped in this issue. Yeah, I just didn't understand what was going on. Oh. Were there any other characters in it? or None that I recognized. Hmm. Well, I mean, Superman was mentioned. There were others that I probably would have mentioned, or would have recognized had I had a little more knowledge. But Okay. Alright. So it sounds like you would read one over the other, definitely. Yeah, well, Poison Ivy is just cooler. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's easier for me to look at, I admit. Uh, Steve, you mentioned that uh, you ran out of time, unfortunately. Uh, I went ahead and uh, did some reading while we were talking earlier, so... Oh, good. okay. Nice to know you're paying attention. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what did you read? Uh, I read Penguin and Black Manta. Both? Yeah. My God, we have to get you checked for something. <laughs> <laughs> well, how was the Penguin? Um... The Penguin was not precisely an origin story. It did do a, a little bit of a flashback uh, into uh, his school life. Uh, but mainly it was just about him asserting his authority over Gotham City uh, now that Batman has uh, been removed. Uh, I found it quite interesting. I Penguin's one of those villains of Batman's that isn't really... Well, none of his villains are really super villains... No, and but the, the Penguin is one of the least flashy, in my opinion. Exactly. And the fact that, uh, from what I understood, he had kind of stepped down from even, you know, the overt uh, crime committing and had gone semi-legitimate in the fact that he owns a casino now mm-hmm. and uh, is primarily, a, from what I gather, a weapons dealer or something of that nature. Okay, is he uh, still using the... a crime the... syndicate boss, then... Than you know the guy that's going out you know with his little you know uh, penguin esque henchmen and and so forth you know that 
I remember from back in the day. Uh, is he still based out of the Iceberg Lounge? Yes. Okay. That is actually his casino. Okay. Uh, and uh, it was pretty impressive, though. He had uh, three uh, lame uh, guys come in and, and uh, steal some or swindle some money out of his casino, and he basically took all three of them on with uh, one umbrella. Which, uh, normally he's tricks. not what I would, yeah. Normally he's not what I would consider a, an intimidating opponent, but you know, I don't know. I would definitely. It was it was a good read. Uh, yeah. I, I read that issue, and I, I did find it interesting that the Penguin, um, they they're trying to reestablish him as a major Batman villain instead of one of the ancillary ones that he kind of became in the 2000s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it, was, it was very well characterized as far as Penguin, but unfortunately to do so, they did seem to stick him with a lot of stereotypical thugs, if that makes any sense. He, he only looked that interesting because he was paired up with a bunch of people that were just that more boring. Yeah, um, but I think, I mean, honestly, him taking out those three guys that were trying to swindle him and whatever, it was honestly the narrative that drew me in. Uh, well, it, I mean, his physical exploits were interesting, but what really kind of hooked me in the issue was how smart he really was. I mean, he managed to swindle a, a political hack, more or less. Well, I, I think just the callousness towards one of his only friends growing up was jarring. Yes. And, uh, but yeah, he definitely, uh, pulled off a, uh, political coup. Uh, and it was, I, I don't even know what to say about the fact that, uh, the guy later goes on to kill himself and what impact that's going to have. But, uh, yeah. No, it was, I, I, I found it very uh, very interesting. Well, considering that the guy's, what, the governor of Gotham City? Or I think cities mayor. can have governors. Yeah, that's what I was... I was like, no, I can make mayor. Yeah, but mayor, yeah. Uh, I would assume that would have some impact. Uh, probably, but if I remember correctly, the guy's plan was to create a... Uh, was to regentrify the waterfront where the Iceberg Lounge sits and eventually gets rid of it. So the fact that he's gone would only put a hiccup in the plan and probably help him more than anything else. Uh, what was the other thing you read? Black, uh, Manta? Black Manta? Yep. Now, what did you think of that? Um, because I know we read Aquaman in a previous episode. Yeah. Um, it kind of went in, you know, back into his, uh, the reason why he has such uh, hatred towards Aquaman. Uh, but overall, it... It was really just kind of a tool to set up the uh, the syndicate, or is that what they're calling it? Or you mean Forever Evil? Yeah, uh, it's a tie-in to Forever Evil, but I can't remember what they're calling their. Uh... They're still. Um, I think they're calling it the Injustice Society or something like that. Uh, the society. Secret, yeah, it's the secret, secret society. society. Well, yeah. the secret society is the the crime syndicate's army of super villains. Yeah. But the crew that Lex Luthor is putting together, and I think he's supposed to be a part of, is called the Injustice Gang. Okay. Well, either way. Uh, you see how complicated this is? <laughs> it yeah. really, really just was, was kind of a, a setup for uh, why Black Man is so pissed and, and is willing to, uh, to fight uh, the crime syndicate. Didn't it seem like they were setting him up as an anti-hero, though? Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Uh, uh, he, he, had a, he had an origin similar to Punisher and Spider-Man, for crying out loud. Yeah. Except not nearly as young. No, that's true. Uh, would you read either of these on your own if these characters uh, actually got series? Um, Penguin, quite possibly. Black Manta, um, probably not. Okay. All right, uh, Jesse, what did you read? I went and read uh, Killer Croc and Count Vertigo. Okay. As well as everything else. No, no, I didn't get to everything else. <laughs> I don't... Uh, now, I read The Killer Croc. I did not recount Vertigo. Uh, start with Vertigo. Vertigo, okay. Where to begin? <laughs> I believe he's a count. Well. Was he the same count in Sesame Street? <laughs> no, he was, uh, 
his origin story starts off with uh, his mother taking him away from the, their land because uh, rebels have killed uh, his father, who has tried to stand up to them, and, and they left. She had to provide for him by doing uh, odd jobs and horn herself out. Okay. And But still trying to keep the idea that he is a count, he is this ruler, this one land, blah, 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 just kept going. But this, for her, this everything just deteriorated, just keep going downhill. He eventually, she eventually gave him up, or sold, uh, depending on perspective, to a company that would take care of him and make him better, more powerful, or something, or something along those lines. Mm-hmm. And for him, while he's growing up there, he just got picked on because he, he kept the stuff buried he had with him since he since he left his country, and uh, he pushed him a little bit too far. Made fun of him. Didn't matter when they got starting, you know, make, poking at his mother, calling her a whore and whatnot. Yeah, he dropped them all. Okay. And so he's over. he's the Spock of the new Fifty Two. <laughs> yeah, just he yells and. And yeah, indeed, it's all dropped. Okay. Uh, how was the art in it? It was hard for me to get into, uh, to be honest. But it, 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 the art, I can't remind you, of this very dark, dark green and very angry. Hmm. Okay. And uh, you read Killer Croc, which is actually one of the things I picked up for this project. Uh, Killer Croc. I read that. I found his order sort of the interesting. I know... Uh, be straight, uh, gosh, I would say typical, but basically lost his parents, and the only person they gave it to was his aunt, who just didn't give two shits about him. Okay. No one else gave two shits about him, and he just had to kind of do things for himself on his own. Okay, now how did and he get his he, powers? Was, I mean, did he bathe himself in something? No, he actually has a genetic condition that makes his, uh, uh, skin uh, hard and scaly. Okay, at least his he didn't say was, a, at least he didn't say his, he was a crocodile and, user. I mean, shit, that would have been scary. <laughs> no, and uh, and his teeth are just you know filed and he's filed down his teeth for the sharpness. Huh. So he's just a general genetic mutation. Yeah, he actually joined a freak show and and um, his uh, turn down toward you know life of crime occurred when the guy running that running that show kind of screwed him over on money and he's. And the guy says, what are you going to do? And, you know, don't bite the hand that feeds you. And, well, he did. Huh. <laughs> oh, in, uh, I was going to say, in moving on to the present day, he's pretty much decided to uh, take it upon himself to take on the people that Gotham has abandoned. And that actually satisfied my curiosity why he helped uh, Roy Harper. Hmm. Well, he it's... turned them into his own gang. He's effectively a, a, a gang leader. At this point, well, that was the kind of the thing I took away from reading it was that they turned Killer Croc on his head in in just about every other version, including the uh, the Arkham games. Croc's been lowbrow. He has not been yeah. a very intelligent character or a well thought out one. The one in this comic book, he does seem like he has a large plan going on. He does seem like he can outthink someone. And yeah. I'm I'm not used to that. I found it compelling. Uh, I almost wish that the, that particular issue went longer. I mean, what would you read this uh, if he got his own uh, series? I honestly, I would, would give it a few to see if it uh, actually uh, uh, kind of gets going. But if it actually gets roll back to him as being just a big thug, I'm really not interested. Okay. Well, uh, I. Killer Croc was one of the ones I picked in this. Um, I also uh, picked up the issues of uh, Ocean Master, Joker's Daughter, and The Black Hand. Uh, Ocean Master was... kind of fell into the same trappings Black Manta did. You have a character who is not inherently evil, but basically made a few bad choices. And because of that, uh, he is a villain. You know, Obviously, he's still the misbegotten uh, half-brother of Aquaman. And... He's one of those characters that he won't uh, he won't do anything bad to you unless you really piss him off. And uh, those people that help him, I don't know. He doesn't exactly help them, but he just won't kill them. Really? He killed that one guy. He gave him water. Yeah, but they were still insulting. Uh, actually, the one guy who gave him water, 
Well, yeah, that was a uh, that was his gift though, because the man's leg was busted and he wasn't going to survive much longer anyway. That was his version of mercy. <clears throat> I guess. Uh, I mean, he didn't actually seem to give a care about anybody until he decided that a uh, nine-year-old was too young to die as the uh, the secret society was taking over the world during the absence of heroes. And that's about where it ended. It sounds like he's going to be another one of the Injustice gang. I mean, the art was sharp and everything, but it really doesn't give you much of a place to relate to the character. Yeah. He just se- He just seems like this guy wandering around doing his thing. Uh, now, in this month, Joker's Daughter, I was looking forward to that so we could get an idea as to where this character came from, because uh, a lot of the internet speculation said this was going to be either Harper Rowe or uh, Carrie Kelly, the two lead candidates to become the new Robin. And it turns out this girl was neither one. Oh, man. Uh, I read that. Yeah, she was wandering around in a sewer and just happened to find the Joker's cast-off face and decided it was pretty enough to put on her own. That's it. Hmm. You have yep. a mental patient who is physically scarring herself because she doesn't see beauty as most other people does. Uh, she likes the disfigurement she causes herself, including self-cutting or jumping when somebody's trying to perform plastic surgery on her. It's The issue got even weirder from there because she somehow uh, got... She picked up a wrought iron staff that has a moon on the end of it, basically part of a fence... And she started superheating it, superheating the moon and burning it across people's faces so it looks like they have these twisted smiles. And for some reason after that, that I haven't picked up on, after she burns them, they tend to follow her in almost, I don't know, martyr-like fashion? I don't, I don't, yeah. I don't know why someone burns your face and suddenly you're compelled to do everything they say. There was nothing about the issue that really made sense. No. And it looked like it was, the art was very similar to the Buffy comics we read a few months ago. Hmm. So it, there, was, there was nothing really compelling about this character at all. I, I thought we were finding a new foil. All we know for sure is that she is unusually obsessed with Batgirl. Hmm. I think they're trying to go try to make it the same character, and I think they just did it wrong. Well, they did something wrong, because there's no ties to anything, and there's no real clear motivation for anything she does or any of her followers. The only thing you get in the end is that she's now in charge of this subterranean hellhole. Uh, I, I couldn't recommend that to anybody because even as somebody who's stayed on the periphery of the New 52 to stay involved in storylines at least, I was completely lost. And uh, I read The Black Hand because I used to be uh, reading Green Lantern with some fervor up until a few months ago. And... Uh, Unfortunately, this is also not a jump in point. This is kind of a continuation of what happened to him post the uh, the War of Light and the dispelling of the Black uh, the Black Lantern Corps. If you had not read what has gone on prior, you, you would have been shit out of luck. Uh, about the only thing that has become clear is that he somehow now exudes an aura of death about him. He can cause other things to rot, which immediately become spies for him, and anything uh, that these... I guess you could say Minion's Touch also dies. So when he gets out of prison with a couple of zombies, he, of course, starts a brand new uh, zombie apocalypse in his way. About the only real compelling thing he does is he rips off his own rotting uh, right hand and replaces it with the right hand of Hal Jordan's father from the grave. Yeah, it's just creepy all around. It's creepy, but at the end, that also doesn't make sense. It seems like an awful lot of work for symbolism. He's not all all there in the head, I guess. Uh, well, he, his origin was told before. It wasn't at all in this issue. He was basically part of a mortician's family, and he's been obsessed with death forever. You know, he would take naps in coffins just to pass time. But again, if you had no bearing on the character, you would have no idea what's happening in this issue. Mm. So out of the uh, out of the four I picked, Ocean Master, Killer Croc, Joker's Daughter, Black Hand, Croc would be the only one I would read on my own. And even then, as Jesse said, if it starts uh, changing back into just this monstrous machine of, or this monstrous thug of a beast, I wouldn't have any reason to stay. <clears throat> and I think that's the failing of Villains Month. Uh, they took 52 villains, gave them each one issue over the month, and even though DC is lauding 
well, not just DC, but their fans, lauding how big the sales were over the month. I don't think they can continue this because 90% of these characters are not continuing their stories. They're all one-shots. I mean, after this, like, nine of these issues are going back to being regular Batman books. But the Poison Ivy ends with uh, Gotham City encased in plants, so... Well, no, it's just one segment uh, encased in plants. Well, fair yeah, it, no, I actually read a uh, secret society actually expand on what's happening. Th- oh no, sorry, Scarecrow expand on what's happening there, and all the villains there just took their own part of Gotham. Said it's mine. Well, the, <laughs> well, the the main Arkham villains did anyway. The Blackgate ones are apparently a whole other problem. But that's another problem with this story is that Villains Month could have been a great place for a lot of new readers to jump in and really learn something brand new about a lot of these characters. But half of these stories are not good jump-in points. They're all continuations as to what's going on in Forever Evil. If somebody started reading Villains Month, I mean, I'm sure they'd have a lot of the same questions. Well, why are the heroes gone? Why are we following this guy? And who's really in charge? They pass around a lot of names, but not a lot of explanations in any of these issues. I'm still trying to figure out how the, uh, the crime syndicate's coins are transmitters or communication devices. Don't think too hard. I'm not trying to. I just I can't see the success continuing because now that all these books are gone, it's turning into the same thing. You know, the DC sales have changed in such a way that the Vibe and Katana series they didn't even get full notices of cancellation. They're just playing going away as of December. Hmm. And when you think about most of DC's popular books, they have one of three names associated with them: Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman. If they don't have those names in the marquee, they're part of the teams that these characters are on, with a few exceptions, but largely the same thing. That's why you have the two series that are called Batman Superman and Superman Wonder Woman. I guess now all we need is a Batman Wonder Woman series, and, you know, fans of the big three can go masturbate and whatever. (laughs) But the New 52 was supposed to be brought in to add diversity to DC's cast, and all that diversity has gone away because... In the end, I don't think DC's ever really promoted a lot of these sub-characters like you would hope. Even the Justice League of America, which had a bunch of B-rank uh, heroes that look like they're getting ready to get a serious push, are becoming the Justice League of Canada, and I think half those characters are going wayside. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, I-, I think that's one of the major failings of DC and why I've never read them with, with any real fervor. They do a terrible job of pushing other characters. If you're not a Justice League member in the end, it seems like you really don't matter to the end result. Yeah. So, I mean, if you're a DC fan, great. Absolutely great. Read whatever makes you happy. But this is my problem as a long-term comic book reader trying to get into this. Even the New 52 has not refreshed the way DC works enough. We're still dealing with a, a lot of the same characters having a lot of the same problems. Either you're the Justice League or you're shit. Yeah. Well, you either have to be affiliated somehow with the Justice League or you're really not important. Yeah, and, and there's a lot of great characters that have lost series. and I'm not going to count Vibe among that number. But, I mean, Katana has lost her series. Static Shock has lost his series. I don't think the Blue Beetle ever got a second chance at a series. Uh, the Teen Titans is not a revolving door anymore, but there's still very little explanations of what's going on, and it doesn't even seem like the writers are on the same page. Early in the Teen Titans series, after New 52, they mentioned that there was a prior team that didn't do so well. Turns out that was an editorial mistake. There Oops. is no prior team, and they just had to stop talking about it. Ah, <sighs> oh, really? Yes. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. So, I, I'm kind of curious. I. I didn't they they do the whole New 52 thing in order to bring in the uh, characters that they got when they took over um, Image? Uh, No, and you're thinking of Wildstorm. Or Wildstorm, yeah. Um, No, that was just a chance to bring in these characters and integrate them into the DC Universe, but the idea was supposed to be telling focused storytelling and providing a brand new jump-in point for new readers to come in. It's just, it has not worked that well for me because a lot of the storylines pre-52 have carried over into the new 52. 
the timeline is so jumbled, I can't make heads or tails of it, and several of the editors still haven't explained it. And then, let alone, a lot of the characters they've thrown in have been thrown in without any build-up or fanfare. I mean, they gave Vibe a new series and a new purpose in the second wave, I guess a year into this this project. But prior to that, Vibe had been one of the biggest jokes in DC as one of the worst characters they'd ever had. So without the build-up, why would anyone buy a new series? They apparently changed his powers and how they work. It used to be he got his powers by breakdancing. <laughs> really? And now, now he generates vibrations, which is a good change in everything, but if I hadn't read that, I wouldn't have even known it because I don't read Vibe. And obviously not enough people do. You, you see what I'm getting at here? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, Katana's losing her series. I always consider her kind of a C-grade because she had an interesting backstory, but she had some of the the worst costumes combined with being on a bunch of B-rate teams. And now, in the New 52, she was put on the Birds of Prey, but suddenly she was yanked out of that, put on the Justice League, or the, yeah, the Justice League of America. Uh, they tweaked her power some, but that wasn't really explained very well unless you read certain things. There was no build-up. Why would this character get her own series if she didn't have much of an audience to begin with? Unknown. Yes. And yet there's, like, 12 different Bat titles, there's 6 different Superman titles, probably 8 if you count Superboy and Supergirl. You know? I'm almost surprised there isn't 5 different Wonder Girls. Yeah. They could date the Robins. I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) Yet more of uh, Sloppy Seconds. Oh, you fucking (laughs) asshole. I knew it was coming. I had to. He was getting on a rant. Uh, (laughs) Trading Robins. That's what you could call it. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, this is just... This is my issue with it. And you guys can agree or disagree as you please. I I just can't find any place to get into DC. I tried. I really did. I'm even... I've finally given up on uh, on the Outlaws. (laughs) I I thought Justice League of America was going to be the point where I jumped in. That had a pretty good cast and a good idea around it, but... Everything has happened so quickly, flying into Forever Evil, it seems like the Justice League of America never really got its feet settled. And now the team is already being fractured and split apart. Hmm. You, know, you yeah, have to have something I, beyond name recognition to, to carry a story. I don't know, it just yeah. seems like... I mean, I, I've always had a problem with the, with the little five-year lead-in yes, type so thing. I. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It that just that that in and of itself kind of fast forwarded everything. It, mm-hmm. it kind of stuck it on that that really quick pace because you're you're left trying to catch up to what happened during this five years. Certain uh, characters handled it a little better than others. I still have yet to hear how the hell Batman went through five you know went through all his Robins in five years. Phrasing. <laughs> That was phrased appropriately for my... No, it wasn't. <laughs> oh, yes, it was. That was exactly what I meant. You're it trying to figure crazy. out how Batman went through five Robins in five years. No. No. Could have said train <laughs> protégés, but no. I think it works. This anyway. makes it sound like a Vatican nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> it probably was. <laughs> oh, but in any case, uh, yeah, they, they just... It, it kind of was already on that that little fast forward type thing, and then yeah, they just jumped into a new arc and jumped into another major story and jumped into another. It, it there was no time for any kind of consistency to be built up. There was no, uh, I don't know. It almost seems like they don't really have a plan. They're it just kind seem of to be the problem. It seems like they've left the plan to Jeff Johns without actually trying to help him get there. Yeah, well, I, I don't know. I mean, it just seems like they're going, um, okay, we just released this, you know, little story arc, and it got our sales up, and now we're going to go back and do some normal everyday, oh, crap, our sales are flying, let's do another story arc. Uh, okay, it, and it, it just, it's kind of going like that to mm. me. That That's what it seems like. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm worried we're on our way to Buana Beast getting his own series. <laughs> It seems like they're just throwing stuff against the wall to see what sticks. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, I think we're about done there. I mean, Villains Month had a lot of 
interesting one shots, but it could still be very confusing unless you're already a DC fan. Mm, yeah, I, suppose. I think I, mean, I, I think this is unfortunately a successful sales gimmick, but I don't think it's a great storytelling uh, mm. st- storytelling idea. I will yeah, say for some, but not for all. I will say, I think Poison Ivy did fairly well as far as being kind of standalone. I'd uh, say uh, uh, Count Vertigo did well too. I mean, I had to get o- over the uh, art style, but the the story, uh, the dude, you you kind of feel sorry for him. Well, t- I, I think the only way that DC could make something positive out of this is instead of trying to come out with another uh, comic book of a Sea Raider or another big three comic book is to take some of these characters, some of the ones that people have locked into, and try and create an anti-hero book. They did it before with the Secret Six, and now they could do it with characters that people are a little more familiar with. Like Poison Ivy, or Harley Quinn, or you know, a couple others in that realm. Deadshot. I think that's but, why you got the Suicide Squad. Uh, that's kind of a different story, but unfortunately I, I don't I tried reading that after reading this, seeing if it was more interesting, and it's just, it's the same kind of confusion. There's a continuing story that I'm not in the middle of. So, yeah. there's uh. not much for me to lock into. Um, I don't have much else. Uh, next week, with a little bit of luck, uh, it's going to be just Steve, Jesse, and I. Uh, V's getting the week off because we're going to Kamikaze. Uh, we have some things to do, and it turns out we have, uh, we have hands to shake. Because I have screwed up. What? I have screwed... V, what were you going to say before I get into this? I don't know. Nothing. Go on. I have screwed up and things have gone too well. Because um, our interview with Andrew Duvall that's scheduled for uh, November 8th, Andrew Duvall from Fangasm, Mm -hmm. it's Mm -hmm. not going forward as planned. Because for some reason I got in my head to throw out other invitations. (laughs) Yeah, On November that. 8th, we are going to talk to Andrew Duvall, Salvatore Fringo, Kristen, uh, I don't remember her last name, I believe it's Price, and Danny Snow. Wow. We are talking to four members of the Fangasm cast. <laughs> Including the winner. Ooh. Yes. I, I, I have no explanation. I really don't. Um, when I found Sal's... Uh, Twitter, I thought I would send him a message since he and Andrew seem to be such great friends on the show. He said yes. Then I figured we should get one of the girls on the cast to come on, and I sent three messages to Danny, who didn't give me an answer, so I sent one to Kristen, who almost immediately said that she could do it. And then after Kristen said yes, Danny suddenly said, sounds like fun. Oh my. I have extended a bit. (laughs) (laughs) So, uh, yeah, so we uh, if we don't need to preview, or we don't need to get ready to just talk to Andrew, we need to get ready to talk to the four of them. Oh, fun. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, but I'm not. <laughs> and I look forward to it. Yeah, no, this should be fun. <laughs> so, uh, yes, next week you'll be getting a uh, one of our podcasts. It will not be as detailed as the Conover, but we will be filling you in on what we saw at Kamikaze. V will get some much-needed sleep. And then the week after that, we are going to nerd up with uh, half the cast of Fangasm. So, (laughs) thank you very much. I invite you to roll with us again next week. Uh, Have a great weekend. I am Jeremy. Steve. Jesse. And V. Thank you very much. No, that wasn't what you guys... Still no one was was willing to take uh, uh, Miley Cyrus. (laughs) (laughs) Third time. (laughs) 